and I will call upon your name and keep my eyes above the waves when oceans rise my soul will rest in your embrace for I am yours and you are mine faith family community Reach Chapel. Good morning, Reach Chapel family. I'm Chaplain Chris Evett, U.S. Air Force. I am here to give you a word of encouragement today and prepare you for the hearing of the word. We're in a, a series on conversations with Jesus. But before, before we hear the word from Chaplain Campbell today, I wanted to give you a word from Isaiah 40. It says, The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. The word of the Lord can reach your heart. Just each one of us are in times and seasons where things are difficult, and yet we can trust that God's word is live and active. It's sharper than double-edged sword. It can bring to light what is hidden in our heart. It can expose everything that's in our heart, but it is also useful for teaching and encouraging and exhorting. We have this opportunity this morning to be, to be encouraged by what Jesus has to say to people time years ago, but it's the same word that lives forever, that has uh, the, cap the capability and capacity to, to speak to our hearts today. And I believe this word is going to be super encouraging for you. Before I do, I wanted to pray for our leaders and for you and to read the scripture from John 21 as we prepare for the word. So Lord God, let, let, let us go into what you have for us. Help us to hear what you have to say. God, may your word go forth and that we would be changed and transformed by the renewing of our mind. Lord, may our spirits be encouraged by what you have to say through Chaplain Campbell. God, bless the word in Jesus' name. So today in John chapters 21, 1 through 17, let me read the word to you. It says, Later, Jesus appeared again to the disciples beside the Sea of Galilee. This is how it happened. Several of the disciples were there, Simon Peter, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, the two other disciples. Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing. We'll come too, they, they all said. So they went out in the boat, but they caught nothing all night. At dawn, Jesus was standing on the beach, but the disciples couldn't see who, who he was. He called out, fellows, have you, have you caught any fish? No, they replied. Then he said, throw out out your net on the right hand side of the boat and you'll get some so they did and they couldn't haul in the net because there were so many fish in it then the disciples Jesus loved said to Peter it is the Lord when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord he put on his tunic for he had stripped for work jumped into the water and headed to shore the others stayed with the boat and pulled the loaded net to the shore for they were only about a hundred yards from the shore when they got there they found breakfast waiting for them fish cooking over a charcoal fire and some bread bring some of the fish you've just caught jesus said so simon peter went aboard and dragged the net to the shore there were 153 large fish and yet the net hadn't torn now come and have some breakfast Jesus said none of the disciples dared to ask him who are you they knew it was the Lord then Jesus served them the bread and the fish this was the third time Jesus had appeared to his disciples since he had been raised from the dead after breakfast Jesus asked Simon Peter Simon son of John do you love me more than these yes Lord Peter replied Simon you know that I love you. Then feed the, them, feed my lambs, Jesus told him. Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said. You know I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. A third time he asked him, son, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. 
You know that I love you, Jesus said, then feed my sheep. This is the word of the Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you and be gracious to you and give you peace. Amen. So who of us has ever failed at something? And I mean failed at something big, not something small, like an everyday kind of failure, but failed in a big way. Well, I think the truth is we all have failed in some catastrophic, some huge way, but we fail in small ways each and every day as well. We fail in things like class and sports. If we're parents, we fail our children. If, if we're married, we fail in our marriages. We, maybe we have failed in our job or our business. We fail in lots of things. We fail in moral and ethical ways as too when we fall into sin or we make mistakes. We all fail and experience failure and mistakes in every part of our lives. We're all marked by our failures and our regrets and our mistakes. There's not a person who has not failed, period. Well, our passage today in John chapter 21 is one of my favorite conversations with Jesus that uh, Jesus has with one of his disciples, and that disciple is Peter. And so today we're going to think about uh, Peter's res uh, response to his previous failure and this conversation that Jesus has with Peter. But before we dive into Peter's conversation with Jesus and how he responds to Peter's failure, I want to share another story with you about a very difficult and epic failure. On New Year's Day, 1929, Georgia Tech was playing the University of California in the Rose Bowl. During the game, one of California's players, Roy Regals, recovered a fumble and in the heat of the moment, and the chaos of the game, grabbed the football and ran the wrong way. He ran 65 yards down the field, almost scoring a touchdown for the other team before one of his own teammates was able to catch him and stop him before he scored for the opposing team. Demoralized, they had to punt the ball, but it was blocked by Georgia Tech, and then they scored a safety, putting them one point ahead. Demoralized by his failure, when halftime came, the team marched into the locker room and no one said a word. Finally, the timekeeper entered the room and told the coach that they had three minutes before the end of halftime. California's coach, Coach Nibs, simply said, men, the team that played the first half will play the second. And all the players silently marched out of the locker room, all except Roy Regals. Hunched over the bench and embarrassed and demoralized by his failure, Roy Regals sat with his head in his hands and cried like a baby. Coach Nibs came over and said, Roy, didn't you hear me? The same team that played the first half will play the second half. I can't go back out there, coach. I have ruined you and I have ruined our team. I've brought shame upon our school. I can't go back out there. I can't play in the second half. The coach put his hand on Roy's shoulder and he said, get up and go out there. The game is only half over. And with that, the coach walked out of the locker room. Roy would go on to play an amazing second half, although his team would eventually lose that game in the Rose Bowl. But this has gone on as, or gone down as one of the most epic failures in all sports history and certainly college football. But that got me thinking, many of us have had a Roy Regals type moment, something that we have failed at that's so catastrophic, so large in our lives, so huge and embarrassing and crushing of a failure in which we felt like there was no hope to recover from that failure. And if we're honest, there are some things that we fail at over and over again. We will continue to fail and make mistakes in the same areas of our lives, but just like this coach said to Roy Regals, the game is only half over. And really, if you think about it, Peter here in John chapter 21 had a Roy Regals type moment when he failed when he made a mistake so catastrophic in denying that he even knew Jesus, denying him three times in what is perhaps one of the greatest failures in the entire Bible. But as Peter's example shows us, our sins and our failures are really never the end of the story. There's always more to be written in our lives, and there's always, as Coach Nib said, another half to play. So let's look at Peter's failure and the ensuing conversation that Peter has with Jesus and how he responds to Peter's failure. And hopefully that can help us to understand how we can respond when we fail as well. 
So when I look at Peter's mistake, his failure, I see one possible first response. And sometimes the first way that we respond to our failures is we begin to wallow in our grief, in our embarrassment and our failure. Immediately after Peter's failure on the night that he betrays Jesus, we read that earlier in the Gospels that Peter ran away weeping after denying Jesus a third time. And from then on, Peter separates himself from the disciples. He goes off by himself to wallow in his grief in the aftermath of his mistake. In Mark chapter 16, at the announcement that Jesus was resurrected, he says, go and tell the disciples and tell Peter. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 recounts that Jesus appeared to Peter and then the disciples. And what the gospel writers and what Paul are trying to tell us is that Peter was no longer considered a disciple. He was a traitor. He was a betrayal of Jesus. His failure caused him to separate himself, to go off by himself, and to wallow, to sit in his shame, his embarrassment, and his grief over his failure in denying Jesus. And many of us are like this. We know how that feels. We fail. We screwed up we can shut down, and failure leads us to separate ourselves and wallow in our grief. That's the first way I see Peter responding to his failure. The second way is we avoid our failures. We avoid our problems. We walk away. We do something else. We preoccupy our lives with other things. We make our schedules full so that there is less time to be alone with our own thoughts, to feel the stinging of our failure. And maybe for some of you right now, this is how you are feeling about the failure in your life. Maybe you pretend that it's not there. You fill your life with other things to keep you busy, to keep you from thinking about that failure that you're struggling with. Or maybe you just sweep it under the rug, hide it, put it away, and pretend like it never happened. We try to forget our failures by avoiding talking about them. But in John chapter 21, verse 3, Peter says, I'm going out to fish. And he tries to go off alone. He tries to separate himself. He tries to avoid his failure, pretend like it never happened. He tries to avoid it. But thankfully, the other disciples, his friends, see knowingly or unknowingly that Peter is trying to remove himself from this situation, remove himself from his failure to go off and be alone. And they decide to go with Peter to keep him company. That's, I think, the second way that we can respond to our failures. First, we try or we wallow in our grief. We sort of sit in our failure, feel sorry for ourselves. Second, we avoid our failures by by trying to separate ourselves from them. And I think a third way we deal with our failures is that we overcompensate for them. We pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, we tell ourselves. We tell ourselves to just toughen up and just to deal with it, to, to maybe get over it, Or maybe when we make mistakes, it's easy for us to try to work even harder, to put ourselves more to the grindstone, to try to undo what we did by hard work or by overcompensation. And here in John 21, when the disciples are in the boat and they realize this man on the shore is Jesus, the other disciples are content to just row their boat back into the shore. But Peter, when he realizes This is Jesus on the shore. In verse 7, he puts all his clothes back on. He jumps into the water, swimming in a beeline for the shore, overcompensating for his failure. The truth is that while we might respond to our failures in one of these three ways, or maybe even a different way, none of these responses to our failures truly allow God's grace to work in our lives, to bring us to a place of repentance and renewal where we can be redeemed and rescued from our mistakes, our failures, and our regrets. When we take a good hard look at ourselves, we find that failure is an event. It's not an excuse and it's not an identity. We find that failure is not an excuse to wallow in, to avoid, or overcompensate for. I think we need to realize that failure is an event that Jesus seeks to reconcile and rescue us from. And what we see here in this passage is that Jesus is setting the scene for something to happen in this conversation that he has with Peter. And that is that Jesus rescues Peter from his failure. There's a couple significant details in this passage I, I hope that you see today. The first one is the meal. 
In this conversation with Jesus, Peter and Jesus have a meal together. But previously, in Matthew 26, the night that Jesus is betrayed, Jesus begins with this prophecy, uh, prophecy of his death. We remember what Peter says. He says, surely if everyone falls away, I will never leave you. I will never fail you. That's what Peter said the last time he shared a meal with Jesus. He's boasting, Jesus, I'm your man. I am better than all these other guys, and I will never let you down. Again, that's the last time they shared a meal together, eating and conversing with each other. But this time, things are different. This time, Jesus is restoring Peter and rescuing him from his failure, from his promise that was broken the last time they shared a meal and talked together. The second point of significance, I think, is the significance of the charcoal or the fire that's mentioned here in the text. We read that they gathered around a charcoal or a fire for breakfast. But there's another time that charcoal and fire and embers are pointed to in the Gospels. And that's when Peter is sitting outside while Jesus is on trial with Caiaphas. Peter's huddled by a fire, fire and charcoal and burning embers. Don't you know that man, Jesus? Aren't you one of his disciples? Didn't I see you in the garden? Peter's denial of Christ, his ultimate failure, is in the presence of charcoal and fire. And now Jesus reinstates Peter with the same setting, the same things happening. A burning charcoal and a burning fire between them. Third, I think, is a, a, another significant point in this text, and that's that Jesus asks Peter a question, actually a series of questions. But notice how many times he asks him. Three times. And also notice that he doesn't call him Peter. He calls him Simon, son of Jonah. He goes back to his old name. He says, Simon, son of Jonah, don't you love me more than these? And the question we need to ask is, who or what is Jesus referring to? Well, some scholars and commentators have said that maybe Jesus is referring to the fish and saying, Simon, son of Jonah, don't you love me more than these fish? In other words, don't you love me more than your old life that you've gone back to after your failure? Others have said that maybe Jesus is saying, Simon, son of Jonah, don't you love me more than these, your, your friends, these other disciples, these same men that you said that you would never leave me in front of? Now, I'm not sure. Perhaps Jesus means both things. But Jesus asks this question of Peter three times because Peter denies him three times. But I think there's something else that is going on here that we miss if we just read the text in the English. But the Greek is very clear. There's two words in Greek that are used for love here between Jesus and Peter. So you see how Jesus is setting the scene. The last meal, Peter is boasting about how uh, he, loves more, he loves Jesus more than all these other guys. And now Jesus is saying, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than all these other guys here? And the first question is, uh, Simon, do you agape me? Do you love me? Do you love me with that God kind of love, that perfect self-sacrificial love? Peter responds, Lord, you know that I love you. You know that I phileo you. A different word which means brotherly love, a deep friendship. Jesus asks, asks him again, Simon, do you agape me? Do you love me with a God kind of love? And Peter responds, Lord, you know that I phileo you. You know that I love you with a brotherly kind of love. But then Jesus asks the question a third time, and this time he turns the tables and uses the word that Peter has been using. Simon, do you phileo me? In other words, do you love me even as much as you say you do? Do you really love me like that? John tells us that Peter is hurt at Jesus' question. Lord, you know all things and you know that I love you, Peter responds. So what's Jesus doing? Why does he ask him these questions? Why does Jesus change the word? Why does Jesus purposely offend and hurt Peter by using a different word in that third question of, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? I think Peter, or excuse me, Jesus is challenging the very word that Peter uses. Jesus is questioning Peter's love for him based on Peter's own word. Peter, do you even phileo me? He's meeting Peter where he is at. 
You see, Jesus loves Peter too much to not disturb his peace. He's digging into his heart and trying to fix the problem and trying to rescue Peter from his mistake, from his failure, which was ultimately denying him. When Peter realized through Jesus that he did not have to walk in his failure and he did not have to run away from his mistakes, he did not have to pretend that they didn't exist, when he realized that he didn't have to overcompensate, he did something great. When Peter allowed Jesus to rescue him from his failure rather than avoiding his failure, rather than wallowing in his grief, rather than trying to overcompensate for it, Peter is ultimately restored and goes on to do amazing things for God's kingdom. Just days later, Peter would go and preach the message at Pentecost where 3,000 people were saved and ultimately would begin to build the church. But I don't think Jesus could have used Peter to build his church if Peter had not been radically renewed and rescued from his greatest failure and mistake. And that's what we see in Jesus' conversation with Peter. So the question I have for you in closing is where are you at today? Is there a failure in your life that you've been avoiding or running away from or overcompensating for? Or are you still wallowing in it, still dealing with it, still feeling sorry for yourself? Is it still causing you pain and embarrassment? Because we all fail, but the question is, what are we going to do when we fail? And you, like Peter, before his breakfast with Christ, when he wallowed in his failure, when he avoided his failure, when he tried to overcompensate his failure, is that where you're at today? Or are you like Peter after his breakfast, after his conversation with Christ, rescued from your failure and looking ahead to the next half of the game? Because like Coach Nib said, the game is only half over. And I believe Christ would say to all of us today, even though you have failed, I am not done with you. The game is just half over. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you today not as a perfect people, but as a broken people, a failed people, a people full of regret for our mistakes and our failures. And Lord, if we're honest, we have all failed to live up to the standards set forth in your word in both big and small ways. But Lord, we thank you for what your word says. You are a God who is slow to anger and abounding in love. We thank you for this conversation here at the end of the Gospel of John that we get to look into and to listen into in which Jesus confronts Peter in his mistake and in his failure and restores him gently. God, we know the depths of our failure but also the heights of your love displayed in the life and atonement for us in Jesus, our Lord and Savior. So we pray that you would forgive us for our failures. We pray that your Holy Spirit would rescue us from our failures and bring us back to you. We pray this all in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Amen.